Welcome in. Thank you for plugging in your um, passcode to get in there. Hi, friends. Uh, if you're here, say hi. If you want to say hi and you want to say hi to everyone, um, make sure that you say hi. You want to see my knees? You want to see my knees? <laughs> no, no. There's one knee right there. Um, uh, make sure that you uh, choose um, everyone if you want everyone to see your comments. If you want us just to see your comments, just to keep it to hosts and panelists. If you're going to talk about somebody else in the group, but don't do that. Let's keep it polite. Hello, friends. Welcome to Rant Academy. Uh, I'm Kale. I'm your host for the evening, but let's be honest, I'm just a human meat puppet here serving uh, as Bridie's substitute, well, Bridie rants, um, because this whole vehicle is a Bridie Connell machine. We've had, what is this, six weeks? Is this our sixth one? Yeah. Um, this is our sixth Rant Academy. We've had so many excellent, uh, divergent and um, disparate, different conversations on improv and what we think about improv. Um, and it's been really exciting. Uh, I'm here on the land of the Wangle people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to elders past and present, uh, extend those respects and acknowledgments to the First Nations persons of whatever lands you are currently seated on. It always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Um, now, friends, we got three, three, count them, three beautiful guests uh, tonight. They're going to give us um, some great conversations. That's really about you as a person. <laughs> that's, that's really a commentary on how you are. So, so check yourself, see how this is really fitting your vibe. Um, we got Shane talking about stop judging your improv. We got Bridie talking about, yes, let's making an attitude adjustment. I want to add motherfucker, but she, but she wouldn't. She well, would, she would add a unicorn emoji, but she will. Um, and Steen talking about drop your ego and play. Want to get cracking? Should we get cracking? Let's get cracking. Let's get right into it. We're going to start off with Shane. Um, how are you? First cool. of all, how are you three people? Is everybody good? I'm yeah, great. I'm, I'm excited. I'm awake. Steen's awake. Steen is in London. Mm. That's in the UK. It's far away. Um, he's doing great. So Shane, Shane Porter, and many of you know him from It's and Around. Shane is a long serving student of It's and signs up for every class available, no musical improv yet. He apologizes for that, Bridie. Uh, for Sketch, he has written and performed various groups as part of Sketchy at Best, Dip Skit, Scary Strangers, and Elevator Music and Stand Up. He has crushed two times performing at Marcel's Secret It's Open Night, but it's a secret, so we won't talk about it here. After running out of improv courses to do, Shane continued on through the house teams program, joining one of the original house teams, Inside Scoop, as well as the Rich Macaulay Culkin group, and most recently, Flight Mode. If you've ever seen a photo of yourself appear on the It's website or on our social pages, it's likely that Shane was the one who took that photo. He enjoys capturing those funny moments and remembering them. Uh, Shane is gonna to talk to you tonight about stopping judging your improv. I give you the floor, Shane Porter. Okay, thanks, Cal. Cool, okay, so uh, yeah, the theme of my talk is about judgment. Uh, in my mind, judgment is one of the main things holding back performers from doing their best improv. Just the simple act of finishing a scene and thinking, oh, that was good or that was bad, uh, you carry that with you and it causes you to think too much about your improv. Uh, and I totally understand why it happens. Uh, when everyone starts, there's just a whole new world of improv open to them. You can do anything, you can be anyone. Uh, yeah, the world's your oyster. But then you start learning about the rules and guidelines of like, or tips of, how to do scenes well and then you start to think oh okay i need to establish who what where i need to uh have strong emotional reactions i need to do big characters 
And the point is that it, it, it causes you to think too much when you improvise. Uh, so hopefully for the people that have been doing improv for a while, uh, have maybe had like a great scene that they remember very well, I guarantee you, you were not thinking too hard when you did it. You were just in the moment, ready to go. You jumped into the scene and improvised your heart out. And it went great. You didn't overthink it. Judgment causes you to think about it. So the places I see this, uh, the easiest one I can tell is during house team auditions. So it's a big moment when students kind of graduate through the levels, they want to get on a house team, they need to impress the judges. So they go into it on the day thinking, I need to do my best improv ever. And that just doesn't work. You can't force out your best improv. You can't think about doing your best improv because it doesn't come out that way. You need to let your best improv happen. So my recommendation in those situations is to just go into it, try and be relaxed as possible and focus your brain on being aware and in the moment. So you're uh, aware of all the offers that come out, you're watching, you're listening, uh, you're aware of how you're feeling and you can just jump into a scene and improvise. In jams, I see it when uh, teachers, jams and lessons, when teachers give feedback. So a lot of students will take that feedback and think, oh, that, that scene wasn't the best it could be because I've, told, I've been told how it could be improved. So maybe that scene wasn't good enough or if it's really harsh or like direct feedback, maybe oh, that was a bad scene I did. You carry that with you to your next scenes because you start to think, oh, I need to not do the thing I did just before or I, I'm... I'm doing great at improv. I need to keep doing great improv. I need to remember everything I need to do to be great. Um, it doesn't work that way. Just uh, if you get feedback from a teacher, don't take it as a judgment of how good you did during the scene. Just take it as an acknowledge. Just see it as an acknowledgement of what happened. Uh, don't assign value to it. I see it in pre-show warm-ups. So. There's been teams I've been a part of where we're warming up for a show and maybe the warm up doesn't go so well. There's kind of a bad vibe. They're like, oh, we sucked at this warm up and now the show might not be good because we didn't do good improv just now. And so that, that's a real bad vibe to carry into a show. Warm ups aren't made there to like have you do perfect improv every time, it's just to get your body warm for improv to get you relaxed and concentrating, aware of what's happening, aware of your teammates, uh, so that you can just get out there and play. And then in shows, I see it. So in shows, judgment causes hesitation because there's a crowd there. So now, now you need to do, now improv counts because there's an audience there to see you. It should be the same either way. Like if you do it in a show, in a jam, it should be like the same level. Um, but because it counts, it causes you to second guess yourself. And so if I go to a show and I see someone on the sideline like doing this, where they're like, oh, should I join the scene or not? I will lose my shit because that is you thinking in your head, oh, I have an idea, but is it good enough? It, will the crowd like it? Is there a better idea I could come up with? And your mind's holding you back from showing us your idea. Your body is ready. Your body is like already moving in. It's like, let me in coach. I want to play. But your mind's holding you back. And so it makes me so upset because you're all amazing, hilarious improvisers. And if you have a funny idea and you don't show it to me, okay, fuck you. Because I want to see that idea. I want to see those funny ideas. Please show them to me. If I see it, I'll stand up at the back of the theater and shout, get in the scene. Please do it. And then Kale will eject me from the theater for causing a ruckus, but I'll find a way back in and shout again. Okay, please show me your funny ideas. I want to see them. Don't hold back. Um, don't, yeah. Okay, in summary <laughs> for my rant, stop judging your improv as good or bad. Don't assign any value to what you do in the scenes. Try and find, try and focus on being relaxed and concentrated aware of what's happening, 
And then when you improvise, you just improvise to the best of your ability. End rant. <laughs> well done, Shane. Thank chill you. the fuck out. <laughs> chill out, dude. Holy shit. Hold me back, Cal. Fuck. I'm going to have to eject you and mute you. That was great. I would never eject you from the theater, Shane. I would never. The idea that I, I love the I love the the conversation, particularly around how warm-ups are meant to help you, but how so often they can fuck people up and, and put us in our head. Um, that's definitely certainly my experience. There's a, there's a lot of conversation to have around this, Shane. Thanks so much. Um, we're gonna Thank come you. back and have heaps of questions. Um, but right now, she also wants to be let in, Coach. We're gonna and we're gonna welcome in Bridie Connell, the maker, the convener of this whole machine, Rant Academy, um, and hear what Bridie has to say. Bridie Connell is a multi award winning writer and performer. In addition to her impressive list of TV credits, she has extensive experience in many other facets of the industry, including musical theater, voiceover, and presenting. Her credits include Tonightly with Tom Ballard, for which she won an ARIA award. It's very sharp. Uh, whose Line Is It Anyways? Uh, True Story with Hamish and, and Andy, uh, and The Wild Adventures of Blinky Bill. As for improv, Bridie has been performing and learning improv for 20 years, coaching for 10. She's a former national improv champion, as well as the 2015 World Theater Sports Championship finalist for her home country, New Zealand. In addition to creating and performing work, Bridie is an in-demand improv teacher and has worked with students across Australia, New Zealand, the United Arab Emirates, and the UK. She's passionate about improv as a tool for making people kinder and more confident. So this night, let's welcome in her talk, yes, let's make an attitude adjustment. Friday Connell, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Kyle Bain. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us again this week. I'm excited to talk to you tonight about attitudes and a lot of commonly held attitudes that we have about our craft and about ourselves as improvisers. Okay, let's get into it. Most people jump into improv for the first time with open arms and open hearts because it is a fun, new, slightly scary hobby and it's a delightful permission slip to play, which is something that we very readily forfeit as adults. This is a beautiful attitude and it serves us really, really well. But then once we have been playing and training for a while, that attitude often shifts. And over time, we go from the kids happily playing, mucking about in the improv playground to those boring adults who are filling in a spreadsheet about successful play outcomes and cordoning off the equipment. We get way too serious. We have less fun. Our egos start to drive instead of our hearts. And we strive for perfection instead of joy. So what has happened is that our attitudes have gotten in the way. Tonight, I want to talk about a few unhelpful attitudes that are commonly held by experienced improvisers, including me at times. So if you are a newer improviser listening to this, you can take this rant as a bit of a handy map of the dodgy areas to avoid an improv land. And if you are an experienced improviser, as you listen, be honest with yourself and see if any of these attitudes are ones that sometimes drive and hinder your improv. Attitude one, I am better than. No, you are not. Do not confuse experience and runs on the board with being better than. You might be used to playing big venues and playing with professionals. Fantastic. But you are not better than other improvisers simply because you have more experience. You are not better than the venue because it's a bit dodgy or better than the audience because they're a bit small or a bit quiet or they're just not getting it tonight. You are not better because you only do long form. You are not better because you trained at this institution and not that one. And most importantly, you are not better than the scene. Show your craft some respect. Thinking you are better than is a really slippery slope. When this attitude takes hold, you have a very large degree of care for yourself and your play and a diminishing degree of care for your venue and your teammates and your audience. 
right? So if you go, oh, I know what I'm doing. I've played this venue a thousand times. I don't need to warm up. You do. Shush. I've done more than these guys. I'll start the scenes. No, sit down. I'm too good to play with beginners. No, you are not. Some of the very best, most inspirational moments of my whole improv journey have been when I'm teaching primary school kids. They are not polished or technical performers, but they are so unselfconscious, so imaginative, so unencumbered by ego. Give me a happy amateur over a jaded professional any day of the week. Attitude two, the audience tells me how good I am. If the audience laughs and applauds, I am brilliant and the best and they love me. If the audience is quiet, they hate me and I am the worst, right? Familiar? Do not get me wrong. I love the audience. They are super important to me. Their reaction can be great feedback in the moment about what I'm doing well or what I'm not doing well, but their reaction is not my goal. And it's definitely not my permission slip to keep improvising. So often we give all our power to the audience. And you know what? Sometimes they are there to see you and to give you feedback and to help you blossom into the truest creative potential that you can. But more often than not, they're there to see someone else or something else or their boss or their school force them to be there. And half the time they're drunk. So why would you give them all your power? They're an equal partnership in the relationship, but they're not the most important part of the equation. Strive to learn and grow, but don't confuse your worth as a performer or a person with how loud a room full of strangers are. Attitude three, I am not an actor. Yes, you are. If you're an improviser, you are an actor. It's a type of acting. And of course, the corollary is that it's also bullshit for actors to say, I'm an actor, not an improviser. Yeah, well, you sure should be. So think about it. Attitude four, I am not a teacher. Yes, you are. You may not be a faculty member or a coach, but every time you do improv with someone less experienced than you, you are teaching them. So be respectful of that and mindful of what you're imparting to them. And be open because maybe they will teach you something too. So having said all those uh, things about some common attitudes that we have, a few quick ideas for how we can begin to change those attitudes. One, reframe your relationship with the audience. Meet them as an equal partner. Audiences want you to succeed. No one has paid their time and money hoping for a terrible night of entertainment. So remind yourself that they're on your side. Two, remind yourself that there's no right way to do anything in our relatively young art form. And this is about play. So be a kid. Show up to play, not to work. And the final thing I want to offer is that you could define your metric for success, creative success, but don't let it involve external validation. There's no KPIs in art, yeah? For me, my metric of success in improv is how much joy and fun I feel if I'm stepping outside my comfort zone, if I want to keep doing it. That is a helpful metric. But if you want audiences and fellow performers to think you're cool, then first of all, you've fundamentally misunderstood improv and you've chosen the wrong hobby. And like, you've missed the point because we're adults who play pretend. That's not cool. We are not cool. And that is great. I love this quote about being cool from the author, Matt Haig, which reads, don't worry about being cool. Never worry what the cool people think. Life is warmth. You'll be cool when you're dead, head for the warm people, head for life. And that's what improv is. It's about warmth and joy, not coolness, not being aloof, not about ego. So don't badmouth other players or schools or shows. Don't badmouth beginners. Learn from them. Learn from kids. Approach your craft with curiosity, openness and joy and change your attitude. Thank you. Yay! Uh, some people were waiting for you to swear, Bridie. Some people were waiting for the the classic Shane Porter esque f bomb. <laughs> um, um, but you do you still held lots of emotion. Uh, and I feel lots of emotion. Keeps uh, it, it translated very clearly through the screen. Lots to talk about. Oh my gosh, I am a victim of many, if not all, of those things. Same, um, yeah, all from experience. <laughs> well done. Well, there's loads, so much to talk about. Um, and we will, we will, right after we hear from our good friend, whoop, Steen Raskopoulos. Uh, Steen Raskopoulos, fresh 
from London in the UK. Uh, you might know him as an Australian comedian, actor, and improviser. He's known for The Duchess on Netflix. He's known uh, for Feel Good on Netflix. He's known for uh, Top Coppers on BBC Three, which I'm sure Netflix will also pick up um, because that's they just they just like Steen. Um, uh, he's also known for Whose Line Is It Anyways Australia, which was a, a great show. I like it a lot. Um, and is uh, one half of the award-winning duo Bear Pack with uh, outgoing AD Carlo Ritchie, who we're never going to talk about again um, because he's outgoing. Uh, uh, he's been, Steen has been nominated uh, for his solo sketch work as best newcomer at the Melbourne International Comedy Festival and at Edinburgh and won the award at the Sydney Comedy Festival. He is an its founder and director along with some other yokels. Uh, Steen's topic tonight is drop your ego and do what Bridie was playing and saying and play. Steen Riscopolis, everybody. Guys, you got to drop your ego and play. Any questions? Steen Riscopolis, everybody. All right, hit that Q&A. Let's see. No. <clears throat> um, ego is a funny thing in improv. It can help you play anywhere, no matter the circumstances on stage or who your scene partner is, but it can also hinder you as a player. When things aren't going your way, you fall back onto characters you've already done, scenes you've already taken place in, moments, lines that have worked in the past. Or if your scene partner slash troop slash performance is going well, there's a little thing going like, why aren't I getting the laughs? Why are they getting the laughs? Why aren't people engaged with what I'm saying? And now you're trying too hard. You know, I really thought that line was going to kill. And in your head, oh, we've all been there like, oh, just waiting for it. This line is going to get a fucking home run. And then silence. And you're like, shit. And then you get back in your head and you start listening to the argument you're having with yourself in your head. You're analyzing too much. Then you're, like Shane was saying before, you start getting into that, that, uh, that stranger thing zone of like, which, uh, which world am I in kind of thing. Um, and and you're, you're, too, you're analyzing yourself too much. Um, you're reluctant to say the first thing that comes to you and it's taken you out of the scene. It's taken you out of the show and you're no longer present. And biggest of all, you're not listening. So how can you serve yourself or the show when you're not present? So here's something to know. You're not going to be the funniest in every show. You're not going to be the supportive in every show. You're not going to get the most laughs in every show. You're not going to always speak articulately in every show. Uh, you're not going to be able to convey the emotions you want in every show. Improv is fucking hard. So be kind to yourself. There's an expectation that we set ourselves before shows, um, whether that's uh, on the day, uh, the week, the month leading up to a show or shows or a festival. Like how many of you guys think about it when you're at work uh, hours before the show, weeks before the show, and you're thinking about like, oh, if this comes up tonight, I'm going to do this. Or where can I do this character that I've been working on? And then you get to the show and everything you have goes out the window. Okay. And uh, uh, different to Shane and Bridie and probably a lot of you guys, uh, uh, and I'm not saying this is correct, but that's why I don't warm up. And that's why I hate warming up. I'm not saying it's bad, but it just doesn't serve me as an improviser because when I come uh, onto a performance or onto the stage, I like to be coming at it with a clean slate, with an empty head, blank canvas, allowing my imagination to build from nothing to something rather than come in and build in and around something that has already existed from what I've said in a warm up or what I've said in a jam during the week, if I jam at all. Um, and also like what people have said, uh, I have a minimum, uh, I want as, as minimum as possible going on in my head as possible. Um, uh, and I don't like yeah, coming on beforehand when 30 minutes before I've already done a character or in a, you know, in a, in a thank you or a freeze tag or a line or a phrase or a physicality that people warming up have laughed at. Cause that's going, Oh, they've enjoyed that. And that's a false ego I'm bringing on. 
um, thinking uh, that it's worked in a show with other improvisers who I trust and think are funny um, doesn't serve me. And that's why Carlo and I, uh, when we perform as a bear pack, uh, we, we never warm up and we've never even rehearsed uh, the show. Um, uh, we, we just, we connect in a different way. We connect in sync with each other, talking about things unrelated to the show and improv. And that's, that's our connection before the show. That's what serves us. Um, and uh, that doesn't matter if we get to a venue an hour beforehand or for an Edinburgh and like you get into the space 10 minutes beforehand and you're waiting in the wings in the dark. Like we, we just don't warm up. But our connection there, standing next to each other, changing lines in the house music is what serves us. That's what we connect on. However, if it's someone else's show and they want to warm up, then 100% I would join in on that. That's what they want to do. That's what their uh, routine is and their structure. Um, and I will support that. And that's on me and my ego to drop my shit to be a part of that. Just because I don't warm up usually doesn't necessarily mean I, I can have an ego that I'm like, oh, actually, I don't warm up because this is what I do and I'm pretty good when that happens. So yeah, fuck your warm up. Absolutely not. I'm all about that. If you guys want to warm up, then like, let's go all in on that. And I think that's what it is. You have to drop your shit. And I'll say that a lot. You need to drop your shit. Every inkling, feeling, notion you have or what you think or what you believe, you have to drop it. The amount of times that we've all had an idea in a show, and I used to say this, Bridie can back me up on this. Uh, <clears throat> if, you, if you're coming on and your idea that you have is going to win the Nobel Peace Prize, the Oscar, the, 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 the Emmy, uh the the grammy like your idea is it's going to solve world hunger that's how big it is and you've come on and someone goes oh look there's my dog you're not going to go oh, excuse me sir uh no i'm pretty sure my idea is gonna no cut you shut the fuck up you drop your shit and you are that dog all right and it's not a dog who can who's a scientist also you're just a fucking dog all right don't try and bring your own shit to it i'm sorry for ranting but i know this is what it is um it's it's weird to be ranting when there's no feedback so i don't know how this is going or whether people are angry but guess what fuck fuck it and fuck you you kind sweethearted people <laughs> i'm sorry i don't know what i'm um uh for for for, for oh i've lost what i was going to say uh da, 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 da. but also like it takes it takes time it takes time um, with that as well. It takes time with with uh, maturing and being able to drop your ego. Uh, there is there's always going to be pushback, and they, you still might have like a, a fight with with the idea that you want to get across, and you think your idea is better than the other person. And you're like, no, trust me, trust my idea. It's better than yours. You just have to drop it and let it go. You honestly do. And um, I think Kale might know this phrase better than I do, but I think they'll close. And I'm going to paraphrase it this Dill closes to say that a bad idea that is supported is stronger than a good idea that is not supported is that i think that's it's something in in and around that um and for me i dealt with like my ego i was i always just expected that i knew everything about improv and then uh lindsay haley came to australia who who i um would say she's like my my comedy mentor and improv mentor and i she threw all that out the window. And I learned about myself that I was more worried about making mistakes in class. I was more worried about people thinking I was shit rather than, hey, being shit and learning from that and growing from that. Um, so I have a challenge for you all. Drop your ego and drop your shit going into your next jam and rehearsal. Find the people and players that you find challenging in your scenes. They will make you a better performer. And in doing so, you will make them a better performer. Um, and I also want to say, just suck, suck in workshops, suck in jams, suck in shows. That's the only way to get better at this craft. Get out of your comfort zone. If you're usually a first player, which means you start all the scenes all the time, take a back seat, focus more on playing support. If you're a verbal player, you play witty and smart, play physical and enjoy sucking at it. If you like being in every scene because you think you're helping, have a think about why you're so eager and keen to jump in. If you're not good at genre, then suck at it. And in doing so, you'll slowly get better to find a place where you love playing genre and characters. I'll finish on this. I used to say, and I still say, <clears throat> when performing as a troupe, 
the best show you will always play is when you don't need to come on because your troupe, your friends, your fellow performers are doing such a great job in their scenes and the show that when you can't come on because you have nothing that will improve their scene or the show. Having that confidence to allow your friends and scene partners to shine is, I think, the best place for your ego to live. And rant. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. So many slaps to all of our faces tonight by all the panelists. Uh, So much truth talking. Uh, Very well done. Thanks, Dean. Thanks, Bridie. Thanks, Shane. Um, Let's let's get right into it. I, I'm, I, I, there are a couple of good questions in the Q&A posted already. Um, if you have more questions and you want to post them in the Q&A or you want to post them into the chat, um, you can. Uh, Rachel, yes, I am uh, double parked. I actually have a third drink as well because I'm homeschooling. All right. And so it's, this is my time. Um, so, you know, this is, I'm with friends. Uh, friends, so I, I, I want to get right to Hayden's question, um, which we're talking a lot about conceptually how to change your attitude. We've had some specific, but Hayden, we've talked a lot tonight about um, how we warm up, how different people warm up. I also uh, am not a fan of group warming up, but I will always do it for the benefit of an ensemble, if an ensemble is doing it, because if you're an asshole, if you're not doing it with the ensemble. <laughs> um, uh, so I agree with Steen wholeheartedly in that. Um, but what do you do, Hayden asked this question as panelists, how do you clear your mind before or during a show? Because we're talking about preparing or actually in the moment where you might discover that you're stuck in your ego or you're thinking about things or you've got one of the six attitudes that Bridie is talking about. How do you expunge yourself from those things? Um, Any specific techniques that you have? Um, Who's this for? This is for the entire panel. This is for all of us. Um, Um, With you, Stina. Yeah, I think the best advice I ever got which was from Lindsay as well, was you're not breathing. Mm. And it sounds so silly to say that out loud, but it's true. It's when you're just like you're too in your head that you forget that you're being present. So I think when that happens, when you're like your your brain's going too fast or you're not being present, you're not listening, I think it, you come back to your breathing and it kind of puts yourself back in your body and it kind of puts you back in the theatre and back uh, on stage. Um, and I think whenever... If you're in a true performance and you're by the side of the stage, I think that's when you have to be very conscious uh, of it. So you're being present the whole time Um, because there's nothing worse than, yeah, people just standing off stage and just not really being invested. They're thinking too far ahead. They're thinking, oh, how am I going to do the next scene? And we're all guilty of it. You're like, oh, uh, in the Herald or, you know, in in a... Always in the Herald. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) In 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 a scene where, I don't know, uh, when you're doing a show based on one word, you're thinking, oh, cool, I've got like six different ideas rather than going first five seconds, six, five, six different ideas, think about it and then locking in on the on the show and what's taking place because that's the most important thing taking place right now, not whether something's going to happen again in the future or whether your ideas. That's also paying respect to, to your same partners as well. Mm. So breathe and think about this thing right now and right here. Very specific, Definitely. very clear. Um, Bridie, what do you got? Um, both of those are fantastic. And to add on to that, I would say if I ever sort of get lost at a scene and get stuck in my head, I'm judging myself. And Shane talked about how detrimental that can be to our play and I'm feeling all this pressure. So to take the pressure off myself, I put all my focus on my scene partner and I just dial up my listening And I really try to treat their ideas like the best ideas ever, which we should be doing anyway. But when I get really stuck in my head, it's because I'm trying to think of something clever to say or feel like I've got to carry the next moment of the scene. So I just 
take the pressure off myself and put all my focus on my scene partner. I'm just going to treat them like a bit of a hero. And then usually that gets me back into the rhythm of the scene and, and feel it a bit more confident. Shane Porter. Yeah, I, I think I've yeah quite a similar answer. I'd say uh, if I want to go like next level relaxation before a show, I might do like a like a mindfulness like put on a mindfulness playlist that leads you through like head to toe, like feel feel your head, feel your shoulders, feel your fingers, and just like lay down and get completely relaxed. It's hard to carry that onto a show, but it might set the mood right. Um, but then when so I'm in that's the show, why you play so many gurus in your show, Shane. <laughs> oh, that makes sense. I'll voice, yeah, maybe I can voice the relaxation playlist next time. Um, in a show, yeah, if I if I find myself thinking, it, it I usually realize that I'm missing what's happening in the scene. I'm thinking about what's yeah. going on, and I'm like, oh shit, I should be listening. Uh, so it's just shifting that focus back to listening watching what's happening being aware of our scene partners our troop um yeah just refocusing on that and doing that as well i think is like being aware of your scene partners on all of that stuff on, on what you just said shane that sometimes is the best way to get out of your head is to help your scene partner get out of their head because if you are looking and watching and i can tell that kale's gone off somewhere and is judging his improv I'm a responsible scene partner and I'm looking out for him. So I'll bring him back. I'll make eye contact. I'll give him a supportive offer. So sometimes it's not about getting yourself out of your head. It's doing it for your partner. So this is my next question. How do you do that? If you're on stage with someone who like, or you're doing a show who's someone with someone who said maybe something fucked at the beginning of a show and that's thrown them for the rest of their show or they, you know, despite not being able to do what Steen said, they're not able to drop their shit from the day like like Brian, um, like like Buckley was suggesting in her talk, how you know when you come to the theater, you're at the theater and you're professional about it. You you do your show, and whatever happened outside of the theater doesn't matter. Um, how do you how do you effectively reel that person back in? Right? You just spoke to you know giving them a clear offer. Are there other ways of when you see your scene partner becoming victim to this that you can pull them back in? Um, not elegant but to my house team uh, we've been you know we I would talking to them about just make really awkward obvious eye contact with them from the sidelines so that they know that they're being seen by you right now you might not be in a scene mm -hmm. together but just check in with them and hold it for a second too long and they might feel awkward but then they'll be like oh I know why you're doing that great cool or just bring them into a scene if they're hanging back and they haven't entered the playing space for a while. Um, cool. Be that gentle guide. Give them a great offer to start the scene and come in. Those are two things I think could be helpful. Yeah. And I think you know the people and the types of performers people are in your trip. So if it is someone who just needs yeah, a scene to kind of you know, shake it off, then come back in. Or if I need someone who needs that immediate affirmation to get their confidence back, as Brian said, bring them straight in. Just keep bringing them in every scene until they shake it off, and then you can you can move on from there. I'd say. Very nice. Yeah, I'd say the same. Yeah, just support as best as you can. Um, I might notice that if someone's on the sideline, people sometimes think by like looking down. And if I notice someone alongside me, I'll be like, "Hey, come with me! Like, get in the scene together." Stop them thinking. If they're across, oh, my camera's gone out of focus. If they're across Very from us, <laughs> it's been if they're across fun. from us, <laughs> um, yeah, it's all the steam. Um, <laughs> if they're across, I'll just like stare at them until they look up and make eye contact, and then be like, "Yep, yeah, we're going in the scene." One of my best, one of my favorite uh, Brady Connellisms is uh, "The floor is not your scene partner." Um, I heard her say that, and now I use it all the time in classes and in my, when I see myself looking at the floor, I'm like, no, get up, <laughs> get up face. Yeah, yeah we do it all the time. Everybody, everybody does it. Cause you're thinking, what do I got? What do I got to think for myself? But you, we forget we're part of an ensemble. It's an organic experience that we're doing with everyone. Um, let's get back to some of these questions. I, ha I have heaps of, more personal questions. Oh, I get some, some, let's see some here. Uh, what if uh, the Susie says asks, what if you haven't been on stage for ages because of fear or a pandemic? 
um, which is going to be a case for many of us. I know that when we first came back and it's the news, I was shitting myself. <laughs> I was, I was, I was in my head, but it was a fucking great show um, because the audience was just like, yeah, human peoples. Um, <laughs> but how do you, ha if you have these, these things so entrenched, right? Um, is there any way that you can sort of beat it out of you because you haven't had runs at the board for a little while? I would say change your expectations. I think if your expectation is to come on and do the show that you uh, are used to or accustomed to playing, then you're obviously going to be disappointed or feel weird when it's not going a certain way. But uh, if I haven't, this is just speaking from experience, if I haven't performed in ages, I just have to come in with the expectation of whoever I'm performing with tonight and it happened, yeah, coming back, we did the Bear Pack show the first time in like 15, 16 months. And living over in the UK at the time and coming to uh, Sydney where there were audiences and physical people sitting down was scary. But I just had to tell myself, like, I just have to have fun and enjoy this. And if it's an oh, you come in your net be the best improviser I have to be the best performer that night it's just i'm doing this because i love it uh i'm doing this because i missed it oh hello hello yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh sorry um yeah doing it because i love it uh doing it because i miss it um and it's i do it because i i, I, ha I have to like i need to do it it's it's something within myself and for susie we all know she's super talented super funny um, as Steve War once said to Yusuf, our form is temporary, class is permanent. So when you're ready, baby, you get back up there. <laughs> um, um, many applauses for all the sentiments <laughs> in there. Uh, uh, anybody else? If you're stuck in deep down? Um, I was absolutely terrified when I did It's the News a couple of months ago, which was my first time on stage in over a year. I was beside myself with nerves. That's a time where if I'm really feeling adrenaline, I definitely want to warm up. Um, and so I did a lot of warming up just to feel a bit more mentally prepared. I did a lot of physical warming up to feel vocally ready. Like Shane said, you know, doing some scans and all of that stuff to feel grounded um, was really helpful. But I think the most important thing to do um, that really helped me was just to name it because the whole day I'd been going like, oh God, I really hope I don't let everybody down because I'd been living back home in New Zealand for a few months and I hadn't done any shows. I was sort of in my cocoon, but I knew that everybody at ITS had been training. So it's like, oh God, they'll be really match fit and I'm not, oh, I can't let anyone down. But then I just thought, they're my friends. I'll just tell them that I'm feeling scared. And as soon as I named it, it was suddenly not this huge thing in my head. It was outside of my head and that helped a lot. So I think um, just saying the words is a goes a long way as well naming what it is i agree with that wholeheartedly um yeah if you're aware of it i think it helps totally it's one of the first steps um i have a friend so i have a friend who i work with uh very closely she's a very close colleague and friend um and she also was one of our first students at it's oh no we lost tina uh, he's, he's come in and out he'll, oh, come, no. back. he'll come back um or uh the uk has just been shut down forever <laughs> uh, uh, so i have a friend who a very close friend who was one of our first workshop recipients the uh, workshop participants um and she would do her grad shows. I worked very close with her. And every week before her grad show, it was awful. Like we worked very close and we would be fighting and there would be such animosity between us. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on? And so <laughs> level five, did we, did we actually map it out that it was the lead up to her grad show that she was like in her head about and she had to process it by taking it out on me, which is fine. <laughs> That's fine. But it wasn't until she had done that a couple of times that she actually registered that, oh, this is nerve wracking. And, you know, Steen is right. It's hard. It can be hard. Um, 
it's both like the hardest and the easiest thing that you could do at the same time once you listen to these three panelists and uh, let everything go. I think I think Steen to go back to what Steen was talking about in his talk. I think one of the the like best pieces of advice is suck, just be shit. Um, because whenever I give that to a class, or whenever I suggest that to a class, I'm like, just do awful things um, without being misogynistic or racist or homophobic. You just just do also uh, awful improv. Inevitably, they're always great. It's always wonderful because they've just stopped caring about the product. Mm. So mm. that's which is, which is so different from how we've been programmed and trained in terms of going to school at workplace. You know, your boss or your teachers, and we're going, "Hey guys, just fucking suck. Just suck at your homework. <laughs> just suck at your essays. Uh, just suck at the workplace." It's 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 in and out for us. And then to be in a social setting, to be like, I don't want to be shit in front of these people who like if one of them's better than i am and then your ego starts getting back in the way and like levels you in terms of where you are in the class but um that's where yeah it's just just drop it drop it drop it drop it and you'll yeah you'll become such such a better player for it there's that lovely quote as well if you're the best in the room you're in the wrong room if which i just think is so great like yeah go up a level or go play with people that scare you because they've been doing it for way longer and just feel like you're out of your depth for a while it's the best thing for your growth possibly it's the worst thing for your ego your ego will take a hit but like a, like a big man show if you're terrified eh, brody sorry oh. like a big manning show if you're terrified right 100 <laughs> percent. it's how i got my start in sydney improv was feeling that fear I was going to say feeling the fear and doing it anyway, but it was more a case of feeling the fear and Steen forcing me to do it anyway. But it was great. It was the best breakthrough I've probably ever had in improv. So while we're still on ego, um, Arise asked a really good question that's that's aimed at Shane, and I'll start with you, Shane, but, but yep. everybody I'm sure has the thoughts on this. Um, if we don't judge from Araya, if we didn't judge our improv, wouldn't we become the biggest improv douche? As in like, I, it makes sense to me that if we're not self-aware about our playing, don't you become a bit of an asshole? Um, I think maybe maybe when I was talking, I, I put a bit of focus on like trying to avoid bad improv, but like if you think you're amazing at it, I think it causes the same problem where you want to keep being amazing. If... Mm, or if you like, don't think about it at all. And like, I, I think you need to remove that level of, of I'm, I'm amazing at this so that you just come into it with a blank slate. Um, yeah. If I do a brilliant show or a terrible show. Mm. Um, yeah. I, yeah. Sorry. What you would to, to go off the back of what you've just said, Shane, like instead of that idea of judgment, um, yeah, if we take it too far in either direction, yes, um, it can make things so difficult for our brains. But I like to think of it as curiosity rather than judgment. If I do a really good show or a really bad show, I'd like to go, huh, okay, why did that work? Why was that moment weird? Like why did the energy drop out of it? That's interesting um, because that's a gentler way to approach it rather than being like, I suck or I rule. Yeah, for sure. Both of those thoughts are really unhelpful. So I, I don't always do that. I have to remind myself to sort of approach with curiosity. But when I do, that serves me a lot better. Yeah. I think judging and caring are two different words as well. Like mm. if, I, if I judge the audience, I judge my performance, I'm judging other people. That's a thing that's, I think, quite toxic. But if I'm caring about what the audience thought, you know, I'm caring about how I perform tonight, I'll reflect more about that, that I'll do a better job next time rather than being harsher on myself and being in more of a negative uh, negative mind frame. Yeah, and uh, maybe another point to make, uh, like if you do have a great show, like it's it's fine to acknowledge your strengths and like respect what you're good at. Mm. Just don't let it get to your head. Celebrate it. Mm. But also <laughs> celebrate the sucking. <laughs> Totally. Uh, Cindy makes a good point in the comments where she, where she talks about we have to distinguish behavior from identity. Um, and she says, I do shit improv uh, does not mean I'm a shit improviser. 
um, which Eden is frequently saying as a teacher, he's saying, because we do shit, because we make shit does not mean we are shit. Mm -hmm. um, which I think is a, a very powerful thing to remember. Also, shit makes other shit. So, you know. I meant. Uh, and those t-shirts let's make an empire baby <laughs> the merch the coming today. out of rant academy the merch Whoa. um so rachel uh rachel escopolis steen's little sister asks i love how bridie says the players and audiences should be equals but how do you keep confidence as a player in the scene when the audience is silent the majority of the time we've all we've all experienced this where shows sometimes it's a new audience to improv and sometimes they're like i i don't know where the laugh breaks are <laughs> i don't know how the mechanics of the show works um how do you keep yourself feeding without uh thinking that you know to paraphrase what Bridie was saying before that the audience is not your barometer how do you do that Bridie Connell it was your question so I'll, I'll bring it to you um one thing that I always try to remind my students and myself is that silence is a great reaction they're listening an audience is literally listening to you if they're silent I think the only bad reaction is if they get up and leave or like pelt things at you. That would be less than ideal. But silence is great. They're listening to what you have to say and they're engaged. They're not talking over you. That's It's not a bad thing, but it feels so much bigger to us than it actually is. So first of all, I think just how we value and judge silence itself, we could change a little bit. I originally came from um, a dramatic acting background. So coming to comedy was something that, I loved, but I was so used to dramatic pauses and silence and all of that stuff first, which is good. So I don't feel terrified by it. Um, having said that, you know, I've definitely had like horrible shows where I've felt the energy change and we're all humans. We, we can like dial into that when we know that like something happens in the room and maybe maybe it is silent or maybe there's just like an undercurrent of something and that's really hard to come back from but I think again you know as we were just saying that is a situation but it's not you as a person that doesn't determine your worth as a player or person and also if I'm really feeling it I'll be like okay it's half an hour of my life like it will be over and I will be fine. It, it's always amazing to me how much more powerful silence and time are when you're on stage versus when you're in the audience. Um, silence in the audience is attention, whereas silence from the stage can often seem like um, the point that Rachel, I think, was talking about. Yeah. It seems like and it's the same. It's the same thing with the ego coming back in, because mm. when you feel the silence, you think, things aren't going well, why aren't they going well? Uh, then your brain starts to talk and your ego starts to talk with you of like, I just want to get the fuck off stage now because this is going terribly, I just want to go, or I need to force something, I need to bring back all the old characters that I know what works and then you do that and it goes even worse. But um, as Buddy was saying, I think silence is a beautiful thing and I think they are listening and they are engaged. The amount of times I'm sure everyone's done shows where it has been a bit quieter than usual or you know, just mostly silent the whole time and then you get in your head like, oh, man, I thought it was a blah, blah, blah. And then people come up to you after, like, that was the best thing I've ever seen. Like, what the fuck are you, can you show it with your mouth and your hands? What are you talking about? Um, so I think it's that ego to, uh, ego to like remain calm. And also don't, don't let that deter you from still doing your best possible job. Because once you flick that switch of like, I just want to get off stage and or you'll not want to go back on stage because then you don't have to take a lot of the blame because like oh i wasn't really on tonight so that's why you know it was more the people on stage as, as my fellow kind of troop not getting the laugh so that's not really attached to me your troop is is you so uh, i know that as well yeah i'd say uh like sometimes i experience it when i'm in the scene and i sort of i'm, I'm sitting there with my scene partner and i'm like oh is this interesting enough 
and like I start adding more offers into it to try and force it and it, it never really works. It always makes the scene quite messy. Um, yeah, I just try to simplify now like the relationship we have with your scene partner, keep it simple. Um, maybe don't worry, don't let that thought of, oh, it's not interesting enough come into your mind at all. I also heard years ago um, from an actor in the UK, the idea of if the audience really feels like an enemy to you in that moment, like if it really feels like this beast that's out of control and you just can't win them over, which as I said before, I, I think, you know, is such an unhelpful attitude, but we've all felt it before. Um, instead of thinking of this whole room full of people, this actor said, pick one and look at that one person in the front row who's sitting with crossed arms and just play to them and make it your, maybe it's a little goal that they'll uncross their arms by the end of the set, but just sometimes we zoom out and everything feels so mammoth and high stakes and important to us, important to us. but you could just go the other way and zoom in and like narrow your focus down. And by connecting just with one person, it reminds you that we're all just humans in a room. Mm. We're not enemies, um, which I quite like. And also, you don't know what that person's gone through in their day. Like, you, you, you don't know. And they're weak, what, what has happened. Um, and it's your job to do your, your job, you know, performing and doing the improv to the best of your ability. Um, and you can't, you can't shift someone's uh, 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 thoughts. Um, you can try and improve them and try your best um, to, to kind of cheer them up if they're having a bad day. But that's not, that's not on you. Your job is to do the best improv you can with your, with your scene partner, say present on stage. Mm. And then once you've done the show, if it's good or bad, drop your shit. It's on to the next one. And I think that's important too. If you think you've had a bad show or you've had a bad, um, a bad scene or a bad night, don't let, you can't, you can't, let that feeling stay with you once you've left the theater it's gone it's a new slate the next show and um, you're only as good as your next show so always know that too um but there's no yeah there's no worse feeling than having a fucking really terrible gig and then you're just over analyzing and feeling embarrassed and you just drop your shit just drop it move on to the next one uh one of my one of the best pieces of advice i ever got from improv hello shane and the Hem shane the mountain I, man so sorry something happened with zoom i signed transported yeah. to uh hey. the himalayas hey. um hey, yeah. <laughs> one of the best pieces of advice uh, i got uh, about improv was actually from a baseball coach um that was a uh, next pitch doesn't matter what happened on the last play it's always about the next pitch you had a great play on the last play. Great. Good for you. Doesn't matter. You're on to the next pitch. You had a terrible play in the last play. Doesn't matter. Worry about the next pitch. So you mm -hmm. could do that from a scene to scene. You could do that from line to line. You did something terrible at the beginning of the season, uh, be beginning of the scene, excuse me. Great. Do, uh, don't worry about it. Worry about the next lines of dialogue. Yeah, and that's what the audience cares about as well. They're not still thinking about, you know, you're the person thinking about that. And it's the same with like you're doing pre-existing characters or lines or something that's worked in the other show. The audience haven't seen that. So why would you bring it back up? No Next one. pitch, baby. Keep swinging. Keep swinging for home. Um, <laughs> it's it's 8.31. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, do we have time for one more questions, panelists? Are you, are you okay? Yeah, I've got time. Yeah. I've got time. Good question. Um, I want to, can I ask you, as per Bridie's questioning previously, do you have an example of when things, when all the advice that you're giving now would have come in handy during a scene? Do you have a, a, a memory of a scene that just went, that went south that uh, you could have heard yourself talking now, just saying, just breathe, just suck, just be present, just reframe your relationship with the audience, just judge not. How, do you have a, a memory of a scene where this might have occurred to you? Oh. <laughs> I can't tell if Stain yes. was frozen in terror at that question or just frozen <laughs> in the Zoom. <laughs> I, definitely have, I definitely have one. Um, and it involves my ego at the time. And it's, it goes against what I believe and kind of have said earlier, but it actually involves one Kale Bain. 
Oh. Uh, we were doing a show at the Roxbury for full body contact male of tennis. And I believe it was at its game where Kale uh, was hosting as a, as a gibberish character. And then you call upon different performers to kind of get up um, to do scenes and then give them an offer and sit back down. And always like, it's a randomized who gets up. And on this particular show, I think I thought I was getting up and then you didn't really call me. And then I sat back down. And for the rest of the whole show, as the, as the game within the show, you just didn't get me up. And never, I would point to you and I would never say, some, yeah, say someone it. else's name. And it was like a thing of the audience is laughing. They're having a great time, but I'm, I'm not happy. I'm not, <laughs> I'm having a fucking terrible time. This sucks. But it was also, I think for the show, the audience just kept laughing. The more like I thought I was getting up and then I wasn't. And as a, as a show, as a, as a, uh, like a, a package, it was, a, it was the best thing for the show because we started a thing early unintentionally and I was like, I was part of that play, but I didn't necessarily knew that. I think I thought at the time, like, oh, he's just not getting me because now it's funny and blah, blah, blah. But there would be a time. And I think it's that tease thing as well of like different situations in life. Like, oh, no, 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 ah, just joking. Come on board. But that come on board never happened. No. <laughs> <laughs> and then... We, you know, I got to perform in the second half, but then I was like, I was in this like really weird mood and weird energy because the audience hadn't seen me perform, and like there was this weird kind of, um, well, this is it from 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 my perspective, like this weird thing, like energy haven't seen me perform, and now, and then I just got in my head off, like I've got to get in like as many scenes as possible because I'm catching up to what has taken place, rather than going, hey, the audience fucking loved that, um, it was probably like the best thing for the show um and then in the second half just come on as if nothing happened like drop my shit and and performed so i wish i had known that um a lot earlier and trusted myself and trusted you to know that 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 was part of the game it was never anything malicious or um anything like that it was just for the good of the show um so that is that is my little tippet it was very funny <laughs> I still fucking hate you for it. But, uh... Uh, Shane Brady? Um, yeah, I I feel like I have like heaps of like little moments where I feel like learning this would have made learning improv uh, a bit easier. Maybe just one that sticks out. Uh, last last year's birthday show, I had um, we had that hard bench show. I had like friends in the crowd who hadn't seen me perform before and I was performing with like really good players like that I look up to. So I sort of felt like a bit of pressure to do well. Um, but I find that even when I get in a scene, it's like, I, if I think about anything else, I can't keep up with what's happening. So I usually just end up doing okay in those moments anyway. It, it was stressful. <laughs> um. Uh, but, but, but Bridie, before I get to you, one of the best pieces of advice I ever got, advice I ever got, was when I was first starting out, I was playing with my mentors, my like old instructors, and I was like very anxious about it. <laughs> <laughs> my roommates, uh, uh, yeah. my non-rent paying roommates, um, my instructors and my <laughs> mentors, uh, and I, was told you can be as awful as you want because they're gonna take care of you you can do the worst improv possible and they're gonna be fine so don't worry about it not change the game for me entirely um bridie connell <laughs> it's very hard to compete with that cuteness um yeah again like shane and steen there's so many moments that i can that i can think of where I would love to just pause time and go back and give myself a little pep talk before continuing in the scene. But something that springs to mind rather than a scene itself, but sort of a, a time generally learning improv was when I sort of started performing theater sports and I had not yet realized that the 
competition element of theater sports is not for the players it's for the audience and it's mm. it's a gimmick and it's a fun thing that is only important for the audience and it's really not important to the people on stage you shouldn't ever be trying to play for points because I did you know I got in my head um about oh no we need this many points and we need this many laughs and people aren't laughing and I you know was playing in a team with really big personalities big physical players and I'm not that kind of player and so I thought it was my responsibility to be the person who picked up all the narrative threads and tied everything together and I got myself into a real lather about it and I also remember feeling confused when it wouldn't go my way because it's like no I've taken this amount of classes so so this should be the result that I am now getting but that's not how it works and as I've Mm. gotten older and just relaxed a whole lot more around that stuff um you know I I think I've realized with that attitude is entitled because my art doesn't owe me anything and I should look after my art if I want a good relationship with it. But I was just expecting all the wins and it was definitely ego driving at that time. It happens to all of us. Um, This is what makes us great because we've uh, been shit. Well done, all of us. Let's celebrate that. Uh, Friends, that's the end of the sixth Rant Club. What a sensational night. What a sensational Rant Academy. Um, Thank you, Bridie, for putting this all on and for giving her own rant after um, supporting everyone else with this platform. Uh, Thank you, Shane, and thank you, Steen, and thank you, beautiful audience, for your comments and thoughts and observations. Uh, any, anybody got anything they want to plug? Um, anything on Netflix we should be watching? Stay <laughs> no. Um, they just put back um, The Office. That's a pretty good show. Okay. <laughs> Great. Good record. Um, mm-hmm. um, oh, I actually do have one that I keep forgetting to plug. I just... Uh, got to perform and compose a bunch of songs for a new sketch show called the moth effect which is on amazon so you can check that out and it was a really fun time it is very funny i doesn't making it australia start on 15th of september too yeah. Wait, doesn't that star yeah. Susie yusuf yeah channel so. 10 oh yeah oh well that's a good piece of advice channel 10 Susie yusuf making it charlie breen Amazon versus Netflix. Don't stress, Claire. I'm in. I'm in that show as well. Okay, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. It's a family joking. affair. <laughs> um. Uh. Well done, everybody. Have a great Thanks. night. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for hosting, Kale. Well done, everyone. Kale. Much Bye. love. Stay Thank safe, you. everyone. Please. Bye. Bye. Bye.